Hello everybody and welcome to another Oh my god, I can't believe we're on the lead up to Christmas already Episode of Pottywood um, I am one of your co-hosts, Steve Hester And with me as always is uh, That'll be me, Andrew Roger Carson uh, I- I've got to apologise this week Because we've not had what's in the box now For a number of weeks while we've had mm-hmm. certain video episodes and it's mainly to deal with the trauma of the fact that Fair Game was the movie that was pulled out of what's in the box. I've had a few weeks of peace, to be perfectly honest. Well, I've enjoyed you, it. Uh, unfortunately, I also watched it again last night for a kind of refresher and instantly regret the fact that I have. But for my emotional support, executive is here. So I basically <laughs> asked Bill Daly uh, if he would join us on this. And unfortunately... He had the displeasure of watching it also in yes, preparation I did. for the show. Yes. Hi, Bill. How are a- you doing? Apt, aptly described displeasure of watching this. <laughs> now, that I must say, uh, before we start off on Fair Game, because we are going to dive straight into this, it is kind of interesting that as soon as every individual one of us watched this film, we fell ill days later. Uh, well, though, no, I was ill days beforehand. Yeah, it just got worse. Yeah. And poor Bill got ill, and now I'm feeling a little bit under the weather today. And it's like, is this film truly cursed? It is. Who knows? Everyone's been asking me, how did I get COVID? So, Fair Oh, yes, Bill has COVID. Check out this yeah, trooper, still coming on the I'm show. Still, I'm still, yeah, I'm still testing positive. My son tested negative today. Um, I think I got it from him. So if if I'm on schedule, I'll, I will be clear tomorrow or the next day. Oh, it's crossed. awful, though. It's 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 awful. I do I do not recommend anybody get it. No, it was it was a week and a half of just hell, made doubly more so by the fact that I had to stay at home with the kids as well. But that's a different story altogether. Mm. Um, yes, fair game. Mm. Now, I this is one of those movies that I had seen the poster of pretty much all over the place. You know, I used to see it when I walk into HMV. I used to see it in the video shop. I remember seeing it on uh, billboards and what have you at the time. So the poster was a little bit of a surprise because I mentioned the film and I thought, oh, Cindy Crawford and uh, Fisher Price Baldwin. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. So I saw the poster and thought it immediately became something that I was familiar with and then I actually watched the film and I know that we're going to get into it and we're all going to tear it apart this movie was just so brainless that it couldn't be used as a donor for Frankenstein I'll tell you I'll tell you Steve it's funny you bring up the poster because um, we had um, in one of the buildings where I had my office, uh, you could, I moved my office, I think, seven times over the 20 years that I was, 20 plus years that I was at Warner Brothers. Um, all the hallways everywhere were decorated with one sheets. And um, every now and again, they would recycle them through with a newer bat so that it wasn't the same old stuff all the time. But some some sick, sickly perverse person who thought they were being funny kept fair game up all the time in my buildings it, it never got recycled out it would get moved but it never got recycled out so we would have to look at this poster and it was on purpose it absolutely was on purpose because somebody thought it was funny or somebody wanted to keep us grounded or someone just thought, hmm, yeah. that Cindy Crawford's a bit of a looker. <laughs> well, that too. Yeah. But I, I know for a long time I kept um, a, a poster of Just Cause in my office. Not because I thought it was such a wonderful movie or a wonderful experience working on it. It was a reminder. It was a reminder not to get emotionally involved in these projects. What I also do have to mention about the uh, the Fair Game poster, it does something incredible in that the first two lines of the tagline are complete lies. <laughs> for He's the a cop on the edge. She's it's a woman a with on a the dangerous edge. secret. And she doesn't have a dangerous secret at all. She They've has been no idea. by the Russian mob, and now they're both 
fair game. <laughs> well, you know, if um, if you brought Selma Hayek into my life and I was living on the edge, I could accept that. Yeah. <laughs> That's my fate. That's the only edge I think he was, right? The plot point in the movie that, that had him on edge was the fact that his girlfriend was kicking him out. Yeah, and, and that all happens at the very, very beginning, and then nothing else happens with it at all then for the rest of the film. Okay, so Steve, a brief outline of the plot. Brief outline of the plot. Okay, so uh, Cindy Crawford plays a lawyer who likes to run on the beach during sunset and then run out into traffic without looking both ways. (laughs) And she has found herself the target of a hit from a evil Russian bloke played by Stephen Burkoff because... Of course, it was Stephen Burkov. Um, and then she ends up under the protection of William Baldwin's detective, Max Kirkpatrick. And then the two attempt to unravel the mystery. And then, obviously, as what would happen in real life, the two fall in love and they bone on a car that's on a train. Yeah, the cast isn't... That's the whole plot. That is basically it. The cast isn't too bad. You know, you've got a couple of uh, decent Star Wars in there. You know, Stephen Burkoff is chewing the scenery. Um, Christopher McDonald shows up as the irascible police chief who's obviously been controlled by his moustache. Uh, he's, he's probably too pissed that he's had to keep it from Thelma and Louise. I was shooting McGavin for God's sake. Yeah, I was. <laughs> <laughs> for God's sake, I wa- I was on a Happy Madison production. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then you've also got a couple of nice little nice little nods, like we said, uh, Selma Hayek's in it for a couple of scenes, and she you know properly brings some Latino fire to it. And uh, apparently, Jean- Jeanette oh, Goldstein sorry, as well. There. I've just got to say, Selma Hayek replaced. Uh, Oh, what's her name? Elizabeth Pena. Elizabeth Pena, apparently... Pena. Uh, Pena, yeah, mm-hmm. was um, originally in the movie as his girlfriend. And the test audiences on the movie, apparently, they, they roasted the movie. And it ended up with her parts being um, replaced with Salma Hayek, which, you know, is a good choice. I'm not surprised, to be honest. I mean, it, it, there's so little that's going on with that role. You know, I watched Home Alone recently, and there's that bit where there's a cardboard cut out of uh, Michael Jordan on the train yeah. track. You could basically do that. You could just sellotape cutouts of these people, and it would still have the same kind of effect on the plot. I don't have, I do not have a particular insight into this. Yes, I was there when this movie was um, was being done. I was busy on something else, so it was one of my associates. Um, who was actually taking charge of this this film? You know, from from my end of it. But um, I would bet I I do not believe the preview audience is the reason Elizabeth Pena is gone. Just knowing how the studio operates and how these things go, the the one absolute thing they had to do after the preview was they had to do additional photography, and I. And they and one of the cards probably was that they didn't like the girlfriend or didn't believe the girlfriend or this or that. I would bet Elizabeth Pena got replaced because she was not available to do the reshoots. Honest oh, okay. to God. I do not believe they would have replaced her because she was bad. And I I mean, everybody was bad in this movie, but um, <laughs> my belief, and I'm telling you the insight that I have, this is just my intuition, knowing the studio. My my intuition is that she was not available and they got Selma Hayek to, to um, fill in for that role and then rewrote the entire thing. Well, it's funny that you mentioned the reshoots because the one section which does feel so much like a reshoot is everything that happens on the train. <laughs> yes. That whole scene, it, it just kind of starts. There's no real build up to it or anything. It just kind of boom starts, and uh, you just feel like that was added on afterwards. Well, you know, if they had half a sense of humor, they would have had that train going into a tunnel while they were making love with the car. <laughs> okay. They, oh, it's they such didn't an even awkward have the presence thing. of mind to include a shot like that. I had 
an, an kind of out of body experience while watching this movie last night, where suddenly I felt like the greatest screenwriter on the planet for picking out everything that was wrong with this movie. I want to run some of these things by you to see if you guys picked up on them yourselves. Okay. Uh, for one, the movie does achieve something incredibly spectacular. It manages to both suck and blow at the same time. Oh, okay. <laughs> a word of a lie. I, uh, I, will straight... concede, I will concede that point. Yeah. Now, uh, it starts off in the first practically the first two minutes. And are we to believe that the highly trained KGB would actually miss her with a machine gun? No. In a drive by. No. Right. No. The, the thing is, if I noticed straight away, Cindy Crawford, I mean, she's not a trained actress at this point. Um, you know, God bless her, she tries, and I don't believe, you know, this movie all falls on her shoulders. But the first scene when she is doing that jogging, she actually slows down for her mark on that spot. No, mm, I missed visibly. that. She, put, she does this kind of pause. You can see her looking. This is where I need to be for this to happen. And it, Could be. Could yeah, be. But I didn't and notice that. If you're not used to it, then, you know, you can understand yeah. something like that, really. I don't understand that. You know, it's it's a good spot. And obviously the stunt woman who kind of bumps into her and kind of takes the shot is the one really, you know, doing all of the action. Something like that can flummox uh, a stage actor transferring to film. Yeah. But the thing problem is, is the first time we get to see her act, where it feels like she is delivering her dialogue phonetically. It feels like she is being fed line by line. I mean, I know, you know, they made a big thing about this being her movie debut. And I guess we're still yet to see her make her acting debut, I guess. Ooh. <laughs> oh, that's harsh. I'm sorry. But it, it was. Uh, but... There's certain things about the plot that just jumped out at me on this second watch that I had last night. The main plot is here. The KGB, they have a boat. Yes. Basically, that is going through a, a, a divorce hearing that she is kind of on the, I guess, the woman's side. And Dan Hadea is the husband and he's leased this boat out to these KGB operatives or whoever. Well, Dan Hadea is the attorney for the husband. Yeah. Oh, the right? for the husband. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. So the problem is here, the KGB state in the movie that they only need two days to get this done. Now we asked ask the question of how Cindy would get a court order to seize this boat for a divorce case in two days. Oh, I, I don't know. Well, which, you don't know what time of the week. Undervalues the entire plot going forward. Then, well, the entire plot going forward consists of people sitting in a minivan. Doing some very very bad mid nineties <laughs> hacking, and then moving from location to location to location, and proving that the highly trained KGB operatives are anything but highly trained KGB operatives. They can't hit a thing. No, they have uh, the smarts of the Illinois Nazis from the Blues Brothers. Yeah, <laughs> that is exactly how I saw them, because they just show up at the wrong places. All the time. And not one of those actors is actually Russian. I guess the guy who demands rent from Peter Parker wasn't available that week. They also do this thing as well. To prove that they're the bad guys, they scowl all the time. They wear black and they scowl. I, I, I'm not disputing anything that you guys have said. Um, but let me tell you some of the stuff I do know about this movie. Okay, It did not start out as KGB. It started out as something else. Um, Stephen Burkhoff um, revoiced the entire movie. Like he he did the he shot the movie in one accent, revoiced it. The version I saw on Voodoo, the version I saw, Stephen was doing an American accent. Uh, he when he shot the film, I don't know if he was using a Russian or a German accent. Or if he was using his native British accent. I just don't remember. He uses all three. Okay. Yeah. It's well, <laughs> usually it's in the same scene. But he but he um he revoiced the entire movie and then later they asked him to revoice it again. And I believed they wanted him to revoice it in Russian. 
and he flat out refused. He he had had enough. He had had enough of um, all the bullshit and everything on this movie. The 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 shoot that w- went over schedule, and then the two sets of additional photography. That's what we that's what we call reshoots. Additional photography. Um, so he had two bouts of that, and he had had enough, and he flat out refused. And then um, that was held against him by the studio. Um, at a later time, I don't know if it affected future employment with him. I know he did the Glimmer Man, and I think that predated this, didn't it? Did the Glimmer Man predate this movie? Uh, no, it came the year afterwards. The year after, okay. Or Stephen so, Burkoff. Yeah, good. But I do remember my boss. Um, something, something happened with Stephen Burkoff. Something was in the trades, and I don't know if he got replaced on a movie. It was something, and I, I wish I could be more precise about it because I'm only just remembering it now. There was something, he got replaced or fired or something got shot down, some project he was doing, and it was in the trades. And I remember my boss sending the, um, the article to um, Lorenzo de Bonaventura in a gleeful manner. As if somehow Stephen Burkhoff was now getting his comeuppance. And the note attached to it was, this was the guest, this was the asshole who, um, I'm not sure he, he used that word, but the implication was there. This is the guy who refused to do the ADR on fair game. Okay, so so there was some animus. There, w- there was a feeling of animus, um, at least between my boss and Lorenzo, I believe. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe it was Lorenzo. And Lorenzo, when this movie was done, was not the head of the studio. Uh, When this movie was going, it was, um, I believe it was still uh, Bruce Berman, who was the head of, um, you know, the creative development team. I mean, still Bob and Terry were the heads. It's a hell of a movie to get yourself blacklisted about, though, isn't it? (laughs) It is. You it know, really if, is. if you're going to get hauled really over is. the coals and sent to movie jail in Hollywood, you want it to be for something big, don't you? You, you well, want to be calling say, James was, Cameron names. Well, you don't want to. Except, it. except refusing to do this movie. <laughs> I mean, it, it, wouldn't that count as a, count as a credit? Yeah. <laughs> You're that good. Ah, that Burkhoff guy has got himself some sense. He's got himself oh some money. He was. Uh, I I like Stephen Burkhoff. I I really do. I like his work. He is an amazing actor on stage. I've seen him on stage several times. He. I don't know if he's he's in his mid eighties now. Um, mm. So I I don't know that he's doing a whole lot of work um, here in the U.S. on the stage. But but I know he had a very close relationship with the Odyssey Theater in West LA. Um, and they, and he's a playwright too. Yeah. He's a published yeah. playwright and they were, they were performing shows that he had done there. So I've seen him on stage several times and he is absolutely a wonderful actor. And I, and every time I've gone to see him, I've taken somebody new, you know, you've got to see this guy. This guy is absolutely amazing. On stage. I honestly thought you were going to say, and every time I see him, I take along my copy of fair game. And I no, trying no, no, no. to well, sign no, it. Well, no, well, he he wrote a book. Um, he's written several books. Uh, he he did one called "I Am Hamlet," and it is sort of, in my view, like one of the definitive ways to approach Hamlet, to approach yes. it as an actor. And it's it's an amazing book, absolutely amazing book. I did bring it in with me to get him to sign. Okay. <laughs> I gave it to Frank. <laughs> Frank was the production accountant <laughs> on the thing. And I, I gave it to Frank and I said, um, I feel really funny going over to the stage because it's disruptive when I do that. And it is, it is disruptive when I would appear at, at, um, on a stage. Um, can, you, can you get Stephen Burkhoff to sign this for me? You know, like find it, see if he has an assistant or something, you know. And he goes, yeah, 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 I'll do it. No problem. Um, <laughs> he came. But he came to my office with the book. He did not get it signed. I said, "Well, did you, did you go over there? Yeah. Did you see him? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw him. And and <laughs> well, <clears throat> I didn't want to bother him. He was talking to a fire hydrant. Okay. <laughs> so I'm like, what? <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so I went over to the stage with the book. I went over to the stage. He was not talking to a fire hydrant. He was doing his lines. He found a point of focus, and he was doing his lines to a fire extinguisher that was hanging in the wall next to where the scenery ended. He was doing his lines. He, he found, you know, he found his focal point and he was doing his lines. So that's what it was. And, and um, Frank was quite right not to disturb him. And I was quite right not to disturb him because um, he was working. You know, he was, you know, we don't want to interrupt the process and become the lore, the, you know, the, you know, a legendary figure in the business, like the guy that walked across the stage on um, <laughs> Christian Bale. Oh, God, no. <laughs> you know? Well, realistically, that fire hydrant could have just been William Baldwin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I know. Because they know. both have the same range. I, I think I had that was to pick... his double. That was William Baldwin's double. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had to pick up on the fact that when we are introduced to William Baldwin in this movie in the police office, uh, his first lines, he's complaining to his partner that he has been on the phone for 20 minutes to whoever it is. And the next thing you hear on the phone is the phone voice say, press one for this or press two for this. <laughs> <laughs> that if anything establishes his character as a really dumb fuck, <laughs> they do it so well with William Baldwin in this movie. It's not just that as well. It's later on. After the after the place is blown up, after Cindy Crawford's flat's blown up, and then they're explaining it well. Okay, this has happened. It was a professional hit. They use Semtex, and she goes, "What Semtex?" <laughs> like it isn't possibly the most well known explosive in the world. Well, we're talking thirty years after the fact. Was it the most? Yeah. And, and in her world, in her world of civil litigation, she had just she was too young to have been a professional lawyer. That long. I mean, she couldn't have been that far out of law school. I'm. I, I listen. I'm not trying to defend this movie. It's. It's just <laughs> awful. It's just an awful movie. Can I tell you some stories about it? <laughs> Please. <laughs> when we previewed it, I did not go to the preview. I only heard about it. It's also, my information is secondhand. But they they previewed it. In those days, we were previewing in Pasadena or Sherman Oaks or Thousand Oaks. Um, this movie seems like a Pasadena or Thousand or a Sherman Oaks thing to me. The um, the audience really got into it in a way, and that's because they there was some incredible, incredibly stupid piece of dialogue that Cindy Crawford had to speak, <laughs> and the audience started to laugh. And then the next time she spoke, they laughed again. It got to the point where if they thought she was going to speak, <laughs> they would laugh. Okay? <laughs> if, if, if just the anticipation of her speaking, <laughs> they were already laughing. Okay? And as funny as that is, <laughs> um, the studio, uh, uh, Bob and Terry, Bob, uh, Bob Daly and Terry Semmel, were seriously concerned that this would ruin Cindy Crawford's career forever. And I don't mean just her movie career, her modeling career and everything that this, she would carry the scar or the scourge of this movie and it would ruin her in every way. And they did not want that to happen because, you know, she didn't even want to do this movie. She got begged to do this movie. They begged her, Joel Silver begged her to do this movie. I'm sure he probably got Bob and Terry um, on board, um, assuring her that, uh, yes, we know you have no experience, but we will protect you. Don't worry. It's, it's you know, we had a similar thing with Hugh Grant in um, music and lyrics. Hugh is not a singer. And Hugh was just so afraid that he was going to be, be, he would look and sound so ridiculous singing in this musical. And the studio guaranteed him that they would protect him. And they did. I mean, they, they, um, it's his voice that you hear singing and you don't hear much singing at all, but it is his voice you hear singing in that song, in that, in that film. Um, but they so processed it and synthesized it and everything to make it, um, sound like he really could sing. So, or okay. To help. So I, so I think the same, the same thing probably held true for Cindy Crawford. We'll protect you and we will, 
you know, and and this movie got pulled out of the theater so quickly. I'm surprised it ended up on home video. Well, at least it actually came out. <gasps> I'm yeah. gonna keep making that joke until Warner Brothers decide that they're gonna act like adults. Um, yeah, I'm just going through my notes. There's one thing which stood out for me more than well. There's two things actually. One, the fact that his partner's called Detective Aragorn. <laughs> oh God, that to be a Lord of the Rings. Thing. Yeah. Um, and the other one is when he's on the phone to Jody, who's his cousin that works in the uh, like the crime. Oh, lab. in the property department. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's a scene where she's on the phone to him, and she's just kind of like walking around and around and around. And I'm looking at, to one side, thinking, "What the hell is that phone cable attached to?" <laughs> because it just seems to go off screen, but there doesn't appear to be a. F- a pillar that doesn't appear to be a junction box or any kind of phone receiver to attach it to. And you have a problem with that? <laughs> I guess <laughs> not. No, I just... Seriously. No, I say that because in, in all of my offices at Warner brothers, since the very first day I arrived there, I, I had a phone on, I, I refused to get um, a wireless phone. I wanted a real plug in solid telephone, even if it was electronic. And I had like an 18 foot um, cable on it so that my receiver, I could literally walk into my outer office and have the phone in my hand or on the crook of my neck. And, and I would do that too. I would walk around the office while I was talking that I was not alarmed by what she was doing. It was validation for me. <laughs> made, you, made you feel right for having an 18 foot phone cable. I needed to be able to walk around. I didn't want to put the phone down. I, I needed to, I needed to be able to walk. I needed to go into filing cabinets. I needed to check with my assistants. Um, I needed to walk out to the hallway. I needed to go check and see if Tim Burton was still hiding in the men's room. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I just I needed that long cord. <laughs> well, in mentioning um, back to fair game here. Okay, there was a lot of terrible things, and there's some little things in there that I really appreciate. I want to see if you picked up on any of these. One, when we talk about um, Cindy's acting range, a highlight for me, I have to talk about the scene when she tries to seduce the nerd in the computer shop with all of the seductive charm of Bugs Bunny when he dressed up as a girl for Elmer Fudd. Yeah. (laughs) It is awkward. Incredibly awkward. It's also so stereotypical. Oh, the tech geeks are real nerdy and they got the glasses on. And they don't know how to handle women. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, To be honest, Cindy Crawford, it's considering it's a Cindy Crawford movie and it's definitely a Cindy Crawford movie over a William Baldwin movie. Her actual role is quite limited to just getting wet for 60% of the movie and Mm -hmm. changing clothes. A lot. Yes. Times. Yes. She is a they copied. In they copied John Derrick. They copied John Derrick. Yeah. His version yes. of Tarzan. Remember his Tarzan movie? I do. I do remember that. <laughs> but the, the, there's there's things that don't hold up with her character, and I I can tell this must be kind of rewrites or whatever. I think it maybe started off as a good script, and then too many people just had different ideas, and they didn't think of how to gel this story together. Because when you look at it, there's the scene where Cindy runs away from William Baldwin, her only ally in the entire Which movie. Which makes no goddamn sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> the biggest thing that doesn't make sense is the KGB are on this covert operation. Why would they blow her house up with Semtex? Yeah. Then keep her alive at the end as a hostage. <laughs> yeah. They, they spend the entire movie trying to kill her. <laughs> yeah, they do. They, they they try and kill her in the, just like the most grandiose and pointless way. And then they, instead of actually putting a bullet through her head, they have to kidnap her so that the plank has something to do at the end. Yeah. Well, literally at one point, Stephen Burkoff himself shouts, don't harm her. <laughs> no. I think you guys missed something really important, and that's the poster, which you would have seen walking into the cinema, okay? And the reason you have all those explosions and hostages and stuff like that, and it doesn't make sense, there's a name on that poster, Joel Silver, uh, yeah. okay? 
<laughs> this is a Joel Silver movie. Because <laughs> Joel Silver knows that we really needed to see William Baldwin's taint. <laughs> <On screen. laughs> but uh, the one thing I thought that was just gratuitous, but then it seeped into possibly one of my favorite moments in this film, where you have the kindest gunman in the world. Yeah. He's like, I'm just going to let you guys finish. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, you, <laughs> even you, though I've got a perfect shot. Are you close? You know, I'm about five feet away from you with a laser sight pointed at the back of your head. But, you know, if you're close, I'll, I'll let you go out on a bang, mate. But... <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe he wanted him to have that unique experience of coming and going at the same time. Oh! <laughs> you know, there's that great scene where William Baldwin, you know, um, he comes out with the line, oh, I did everything I was supposed to do in order to make sure the FBI agent was real. And realistically, all he did was look at his ID badge. Yeah. Yeah. But, oh, <laughs> he did oh, nothing more. Actually, speaking of that scene, that, oh, that has one of the best moments that genuinely made me burst out laughing. When the FBI show up, uh, they get separated out into two different cars. And the the fake FBI agent shoots his partner, and, and then lifts his head up to, off the off the steering wheel, and he's wearing a wig, and it comes off in his hand. <laughs> I thought that was brilliant. That was so stupid. <laughs> Because it was the most convincing hairstyle in the entire movie. Oh, I called God, that a yeah. rug straight away. Oh, oh my it was God. wonderful. Absolutely I mean, if you, wonderful. If you've seen the trailer for this movie, there is more in the trailer, obviously, that is in the movie, including mm -hmm. the entire characteristics between William Baldwin and Cindy Crawford as antagonists for each other, which is not present in the movie whatsoever. No, no. Maybe um, in the beginning, but no. It would have worked because, to be honest, there was absolutely zero chemistry between these two leads, and there is completely inconsistent character work on Cindy's character as well, which yeah. you could write an entire book on exactly how this just flips and flops. I just knocked my microphone over. There we go. That Ooh. was very silly. I know. It's, it's flimsy. Um, the one thing that I did like is when you look at the rogues gallery of KGB agents, you get that guy who was also in Passenger 57 who looks like the love child of Jack Nicholson and Michael Ironside. Yeah, I kept thinking he was the... Have you, have, have you ever seen Star Trek Enterprise? Yes. Yeah, he looks like the Doctor in that. But No, it's yes. not, but he looks like the Doctor in that. He has this permanent, just kind of like pissed off Pout. expression. Yeah. yeah. And he plays practically the same role in Passenger 57 as well. Yeah, he does. But um, the one thing I've got to finish on for, for Fair Game, apart from the fact that I'm still confused why it has the title Fair Game, is I don't believe in any movie I have ever seen so many random objects explode when a car hits them. <laughs> as far as I know, telephone poles don't explode. I've never seen trees explode <laughs> into balls of fire. Bill's nailed it. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. I noticed. Yeah, Still I silver. noticed that too. I noticed that everything. The wind would blow, and suddenly <laughs> there's an explosion. Yeah, yeah. That was. Um, you're really in trouble when you have to resort to that kind of effect. To uh, because the story is just so thin, you know. It's yeah. just this is just a terrible movie. How do you feel about having to watch it, Steve? Uh, to be honest, I, I I got a little bit of joy out of laughing at it, but uh, I just thought it was so kind of dull and generic and kind of mid nineties action cheapo shit. <laughs> That's the best way that I could think of to describe it. Yeah, I. I... If um, now nobody set out to make a shitty movie, um, no. and I don't know what the original script looked like. I don't know what compromises were made because they couldn't get locations, or because, or because they, I mean, they couldn't get a real actress to sign to do it. They had to get Cindy Crawford. Um, they couldn't get the best of the Baldwins. Um, you know, there's a lot to choose from, right? <laughs> yeah, they got a Baldwin from Wish.com. Um, yeah. So, when, when, you know. when you get the Baldwin that makes Daniel Baldwin look like a genius actor, <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. you got a bad movie. Um, yeah, I, but I've, I found as I'm watching it, and this is the only time I've seen it, 
I did not see this when, when I was at the studio. I didn't see it at the time it was coming out. I did not go to the previews. I did not go to the premiere. I had no interest in seeing it. I'd already heard all the stories about the, uh, the previews. Um, and I wasn't even the least bit curious because I just, it just, I wasn't interested. I just wasn't interested. Um, but as I'm watching it, I'm, I'm blaming everybody. You know, I'm, I'm <laughs> cursing, I'm cursing Joel Silver. I'm cursing Andrew Sipes. I'm cursing Bob and Terry for green lighting it. I'm cursing Lorenzo or whoever shepherded it through, through production, you know, absolutely just cursing everyone. And, um, and there's blame to go everywhere, absolutely everywhere on this movie. But, but I kept wondering, where did they think this was going to go? Now, now suppose, suppose it got the, um, the 14% from the critics that it doesn't even deserve. I mean, it should have been 4%, but would it, but what if it got, you know, a 75% from the audience and made money? Where did they think they were going to go with this sequel wise? Was there going to be a fair game, fairer game, yeah. you know, fairest game. And, and I don't know where the title comes from either, because I got to tell you, we would have titles that would bounce around the studio and then they'd get assigned to some movie. You know, I I'm guessing that fair game was something that, um, that the studio had, the studio owned the title and then they attached it to this movie. Cause it, um, uh, because I guess Cindy Crawford was fair game. Well, it mentions in the opening credits that he's based on a book. But yes, I don't. It was already made think... as Cobra, who's still on, by the way. <laughs> Cobra. <laughs> I mean, aside from watching this movie, I I went on the internet. You know, the things that I'm usually debunking. You know, I went on the internet to see what. You know, if there was any explanation for any of this stuff. And I did see that um, that Stallone had been attached. Is that right? Did I, did Apparently I read that so. Right? Yeah. They thought Stallone was going to do it. Stallone was doing Assassins, though. See, that's one of the problems with this movie as well, because Assassins is in the same time period, and Joel Silver would have been paying more attention to that. So I'm guessing that maybe Joel couldn't save this. Here I am. I'm blaming Joel, but Joel also couldn't save it because he was knee-deep on the Assassins with the problems that that movie had, you know, except that you had Richard Donner at the helm, who actually knows how to tell a story. Instead of Andrew Sipes, who clearly can't. Yeah, and hasn't since. No. Andrew Sipes is one of those directors with a, a, a movie so shockingly bad that he's never made another one. But one of the things I read was that, that he wasn't even giving Cindy direction. That yeah, they were barely I saw an even interview speaking. She said, yeah. yeah, that they were barely even speaking. It's like, I wish she had called somebody. If that was the case... She should have caught, but you know, if this is her first movie, she doesn't really know, and she doesn't know what she's capable of doing, you know. But if if that if let me tell you, if that were Julia Roberts, she would have been on the phone to somebody at Warner Brothers, and and Andrew Sipes would have been gone. They would have yeah. shut down. They would have had a new director come in to take over, and and done a restart, and maybe start shooting over again, starting you know reshoots of some of this stuff. And I've seen that happen. I've seen, I have seen that happen where another director comes in and suddenly it's recast and everything else and everything that has already been shot get, goes um, into the bin. True. There weren't really any major power players in this cast or on this movie apart from no. Joel, I guess. I guess he was the, the most prominent person involved in it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Aside from the uh, the two leads, and I see really. three editors. I see three editors on this movie too. When I look at the credits on IMDb, and that's not a good sign. Sometimes they'll you'll have two editors on a picture because they're combining um, like comedy and action. So they want somebody with a more comedy sort of sensibility, and somebody who can handle the action stuff. And they work sort of hand in glove. They work together to put the best thing together, you know, they do it as a team. Um, but this thing had three different editors and it just, it was just an action movie altogether. I mean, it, yeah. there wasn't even any real romance in it. You, you no. don't bring a romance editor in, you know? So, um, so that tells me that this was in trouble without even having to look at it. So Steve, mm -hmm. signing off on fair game, your final word. Uh, yeah. It's just, by the numbers 
it's so incredibly formulaic and lacking in any kind of charisma or or magnetism between the two leads so you can pretty much guarantee every single action beat that is going to happen from the beginning of the film uh the only real thing that surprised me about it was during the closing credits and he said that uh kane hodder was a uh, part of the stunt team i did see that yeah yep and for those of you who don't know he played jason in four of the friday the 13th movies very true yeah so, so that was it with that in mind Fair game, we can find to the bargain bin, never to be dug out again. Nope. And I guess it's time to do some quick fire anniversaries, Steve. We watch them again all of the time. Oh, we get them on Prime for free. But we only know how old they are when we learn their anniversary. Ah, yes. Anniversaries. It's been a fair few weeks since we've celebrated some anniversaries. Yeah. So I wanted to pull three out of the schedules uh, because I thought they were kind of interesting. And with the time that we've got left in the show, let's just jump right in. First off, I'm going to take you back to 1984. Can you believe, Steve, yes. that 1984 this week, 2010, the year we make contact, was released? Uh, okay, no. Um Obviously, you know my feelings about uh, 2001, yes. and uh, no amount of Roy Schneider can convince me to uh, to go back and watch this. Um, so before you get into it, I will say 1984 was a hell of a good year for movie releases. Very good year. Fantastic year. But anyway, carry on. Talk about um, the thing. Okay. Well, 2010 uh, was not directed by Stanley Kubrick. This time, it was directed by... Peter Hyams, uh, a man I know very well, a man Bill <laughs> knows very well. Uh, you may know him as uh, the director of Outland or Time Cup or mm-hmm. The Relic. Uh, really, really good movies. Uh, and this one is very interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, the first one being that uh, Peter Hyams uh, set up communication with Stanley Kubrick and uh, Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, to get permission to make this movie, of which Stanley Kubrick said, sure, go ahead, whatever, don't care, <laughs> just just go and make it. So this is kind of an original story. Uh, it is kind of based off Arthur C. Clarke's uh, book that he wrote in 1982. I can't remember what the title was it now. It's just completely shot over my head. But this is a very stylized sequel and more mainstream than the very RT two thousand one. So what uh, you're saying is that this this film was an adaptation of Arthur C. Clarke's original book, Fair Game. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. Uh, I watched it again this week, and you know, Hal was I, a better actor. I, yes, yeah, definitely. I mean, in this, you had the ever dependable Roy Scheider. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and I absolutely love Troy Schneider. We also had John Lithgow in like one of his early roles following Blowout. Blowout? Yes, Blowout. Before um, Santa Claus the movie as well. Yes. And this yeah. might be in the first thing that I ever saw Helen Mirren in, who plays one of the Russians, uh, who's, funnily enough, her last name of her character is Kubrick, spelled backwards, by the way. Oh, okay. And I she know. is actually Russian as well, Helen Mirren. Yes. Yeah. And... There's a, there's a very kind of Kubrick-style instance in the movie where at the beginning, Roy Scheider's son has a poster on the wall of uh, an Olympic runner with Beijing 08 written on it. Now, this movie was made in 1984, and in 2001, Beijing was announced to host the Olympics in 2008. Oh, oh, okay. very bizarre. Life imitating art, or is that just pure coincidence? Well, either way, it's it's quite a nifty thing to have in a science fiction movie yeah. from the 80s behind the scenes of this movie this was one of the very first instances where email communication was set up between peter hyams and arthur c clark mm-hmm. in a very early instance so they could swap ideas back and forth uh, between countries uh, we had email then in 1984 we had email um at ABC television for the uh, Olympics. 
Oh, right. AT&T set it up for us. It, um, it then went away. I didn't see email again until I went to Lorimar. And Lorimar had a way more imaginative um, use of it than Warner Brothers ever did. Lorimar was great. Technologically, they were so far ahead of any of the other companies I'd been with. So how long did it take to send an email back and forth back then? It was instant like it is now. Really? Yeah, yeah. email with, doesn't with, well, need we were it, it was a, a closed system. It wasn't it wasn't going out into the web to be processed. It was uh, the email was AT&C set it up within our own thing. So so we could communicate uh, with the studio, we could communicate with the different venues, we could com- communicate with the two Olympic villages, but they were all set up in the same hub. So right, so um, you had an intranet, an intranet, as yes. opposed to an yes. internet. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Uh, well, I was communicating with players. Um, I, my uh, my boss was from Scotland, and he had a golfing buddy who had a son who was playing on the Italian baseball team. And my boss, you know, was busy working. I was out at a venue. Yes, I was working, but I had downtime you know, while we were waiting for events to start and everything. So I had enough time to play with the actual email. And, um, and he had met, he had come to visit the venue, told me, um, I gave him a program and he said, Oh yeah, my, I have a good buddy that's whose son is on this team. And, um, and I'm sure this must be him. So after my boss left, I, I got on the, uh, I got on the computer, the desktop, and, and sent an email to that player on the team. And he said, yes, that, that is my father. Yes. I, and, you know, and then it became, how did you get on the Italian team? You know, because the, <laughs> the guy was from New Jersey, I think, you know. But um, that's another story. That's another joke to tell. <laughs> okay. Well, 2010, uh, 90% of this movie was shot on the MGM sound stages in Culver City. I thought you were going to say uh, on location. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, not on location. Although I'm sure that's going to happen soon with either Tom Cruise or Fast and Furious. When it opened, uh, this movie opened at number two at the box office behind the totally domineering Beverly Hills Cop, which was still holding rain. There's a John Ashton reference there. Yeah. But it held its own and defeated John Carpenter's Starman and David Lynch's Dune, which were released right around the same time. 1984 was just a killer year. It was. It was 84 and 87. Well, I guess you can say 82 as well. They're like the best years of like, yeah. movies that came out. Uh, if you separate 2010 from the mold of its predecessor, which is obviously one of the most loved films of, of all time <laughs> uh, for most people, <laughs> apart from probably anyone on this show apart from me, it's a fabulous space movie. It really is. It's actually really exciting as well. There's some fantastic set pieces in this movie. The tension is up there and the characterization is brilliant. I mean, this has more talking than 2001 does and this feels more like you know, a classic 80s space movie. I get the feeling that I probably might enjoy this one more than the original. Well, it currently has 64%, so it's sat right in the middle. Okay. Um, I saw this film. I'm not a fan of 2001. Um, never have been. Thank you. I see. I, I'm not alone. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a Stanley fan either. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> but, and I don't gravitate towards... Um, science fiction i just it's not my thing I, i'm more grounded i guess but um but i did see this film in the cinema i saw it at the the uh the village in westwood that's one of the big premier um theaters still in la the reason i went to see this film and to see it there was because they were running the trailer for the next james bond film Oh, honest to God, honest to God, I went to see this movie just to see the trailer for James Bond. Was that Octopussy? I don't know. Um, Octopussy was 83, so it would have been whatever came after that. View to a kill, probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I I first saw this movie on Turner Classic Movies here in the UK. Well, Uh, I think it was one in the morning and I first started watching it and I, I couldn't turn it off. I was actually really pinned into it. But yes, 1984, 2010. 
the year we made contact was released and yeah i think you would enjoy this one sitting at 64 percent, so it's not rotten and it's not certified fresh it's just fresh okay so. brilliant uh well what's next okay uh we're gonna go back to 2004 this time uh when the final part of the Blade Trilogy was released in oh, Blade oh, oh, oh. Trinity. Oh, yes, I know the groan is coming. Directed by David S. Goya. And for those of you who know the name, you might know him as the writer of Dark City. Most prominently, you will know him as the writer of the Christopher Nolan Batman movies, like Batman Begins, Dark Knight, mm-hmm. etc. Or for you TV buffs out there, he was a writer on Flash Forward, which was, you know, he, he also show. wrote, if I remember correctly, he wrote the one or both of the, the first two Blade movies, I yes. think, um, even though they each had different directors. The standout, though, is still Blade 2. Guillermo del Toro just knocked that one out of the park. I went to see this at the cinema. So did I. Um, On a double bill with National Treasure, would you believe? And I, I was working in a job that I really didn't like at the time, so I was taking just random days off, and I, this was one of them, and I got fired. And I can't remember if I got fired for going to see this or Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. <laughs> it was one of the two, but I remember watching this just thinking, oh my god, what has yeah. happened to this franchise? Well... David Escoyer, um basically took over. He apparently got the blessing of um, Stephen Norrington, who did a fantastic job on the first one. That was it, yeah. Yes, and uh, you know Del Toro, who did an amazing job on Blade 2. Uh, more amazing than it probably should have been, <laughs> to oh, be honest. Incredible. Film. So he got the blessing to step in and direct this movie. He got the blessing from everyone but one person, apparently. Yeah, Wesley. And that would be Wesley Snipes. <laughs> Well, it's no secret here. There's plenty of stories out there about this and plenty of interviews, including Pat Oswalt, who gave an interview on it as well. Wesley did not get on with David S. Goya at all, to the point where Wesley even refused to come to set most of the days, which is very telling when you watch the movie, mm. because there is stand-ins whenever Wesley is not speaking or fighting or he has been digitally put into shots. In yeah, there's, it, it's painful at times. You get the feeling like his stand-in is in more of the film than Wesley is. Yes. Is there a story attached to that? Uh, that there is kind of. Patton Oswalt stated um, that Wesley Snipes would spend each day getting stoned in his trailer, smoking marijuana, and he would step out and accuse David Escoyer to his face of racism. Uh, it got to wow. the point where Wesley started passing notes, post-it notes, to his assistant to pass to the cast and the director because he would not even talk to them himself. Snipes then ended up suing New Line Mm -hmm. as he claimed that he didn't get his full salary, which with that behavior, I'm amazed you still have a job. Uh, He said that he was excluded from the casting and filmmaking decisions, even though he was a producer on the movie, and put complaints that Ryan Reynolds, yes, Ryan Reynolds is in this movie, and Jessica Biel got more screen time over him. Well, can you can you blame him? You know, you got to work with what you've got. If the star yeah. of your film isn't wanting to actually act in the film, you've got to make do with using the B characters to try and push things forward. And and there's also another story that I remember hearing. Uh, I think it might have been in the same Patton Oswalt interview where he was yeah. saying that it got to the point where David Esquire hired like Hell's Angels to be bodyguards on set because he was convinced that Snipes was going to attack him. Well, Wesley Snipes choked him on set. Yeah. He grabbed David and started choking him. Yeah, Wesley in those days had, um, he traveled with a posse. And um, I don't don't know um, what the score is on on any of the Blade movies. I've never seen any of them. It's not my thing. New Line may have been a part of Time Warner at the time, but not part of Warner Brothers. There was absolutely no interference. We would have to find out from home video what was going on with New Line because we, we just because they were talking to both of us, and it was just easier to call them to, to see what's coming up. And, you know what are they doing? But Wesley, I don't remember the movie. There was a movie of ours where the producer we had a really good producer who sat down with him and told him, "Look, you know you're you're." your posse, the people you're running with are ruining your career. 
you're getting really bad advice from them. You're getting bad input. You're getting this and that. They're being disruptive. They're intimidating other people on the crew. They're um, they're eating all of the craft service stuff. No, honest to God, this is the this is a conversation he had to have with Wesley on this. And um, whatever was going on on that movie, I'd have to go back and look at um, release schedules to see what it was. Um, it, it could have been, you know, it could have been U.S. Marshal. Yeah. Could have been on that movie. Could have been on that. That yeah. was because uh, we, we had an A team of people doing that movie because Stuart Baird was directing. It could have been that film where they talked to Wesley and said, but it could have been before then too. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the timeline is, but I, I know that that conversation had to be had. Yeah. Well, the, the follow on from obviously all of this fallout from Blade Trinity, it was released with scathing reviews, but still made 132 million on a 65 million budget. It's it's, it's a terrible film. It, it terrible is a terrible film. film. And, th- and this is where Ryan Reynolds cut his superhero teeth as well. I know you're not a fan, Bill, but it is worth watching at least Blade 2 because just yeah. Guillermo del Toro just it oozes all over that film. It's great. Um, but yeah, Ryan Reynolds, he uh, properly steps up and um, and has a beard. <laughs> well. Yeah. It does, oh, yeah, he does have, he a, does beard have a beard in this movie. Yeah, and then obviously one liners, um, especially when he's up against Triple H. Oh yeah, Triple H is in this movie. Triple H is in this movie. Uh, To be honest, I could have swore when watching this movie again this week that Dimension Films took over this movie because it has pretty much every independent like star that was kind of hot at the time and young pasted into this movie. Yeah, Uh, like Dimension Films used to do with their horrors back in the day um the film is not great it has a certain kind of charm for being a bit all over the place well what's weird as well is if you go from the Guillermo del Toro one which is very much a horror film to this where pretty much every other cast member is a comedian of some sort you know, you got uh, Parker Posey. She's known for a lot of the improvisational stuff that Christopher Guest works on. Um, you've got Patton Oswalt himself. Uh, Ryan Natasha Reynolds. Leon is in there. Natasha Leon. You've got the... I can't remember his name, but he's the, the guy in the, the police station with the with the glasses who I think drugs him. Oh, God, yeah. I've, I've forgotten yeah, what I, his I, real name is. I can't remember his name either. But yet again, more kind of Christopher Guest alumni, improvisational comedy, and that does not speak well. Yeah, and what also didn't speak well is this is where Wesley Snipes' financial troubles kind of started because uh, this is where his own agency, UTA, ended up suing him for not paying commissions on his earnings from this movie. And uh, obviously then we... we I wonder know. how that's even possible because the way it works is... The uh, the studios, the production companies, actually pay directly to the uh, the agency, hmm. mm-hmm. and then they will they will take their fee, and and then the the actor will get their thing. So um, I don't know what kind of an arrangement Wesley must have had. Of course, he got into IRS trouble, so he must have been getting financial advice um, from nefarious sources. And and maybe they set up his finances in a really really bad way, but um, I just don't know how an agency manages to uh, let an actor get away from them. Yeah, it's a good point. But yes, Blade Trinity, uh, the worst uh, last sh- showcase of Blade. No um, we're only just kind of getting a new Blade now, and there's word that Wesley may be stepping back for a cameo as this version of Blade. But you know we're, we'll we'll see in the future. It's the multiverse; you can get away with anything now. Pretty pretty much, pretty much. Just so they can sign even more actors to Disney. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that is Blade Trinity. So finally, we're going to go back to 1992. Can you believe, Steve? In mm-hmm. 1992, this week, a movie called Death Becomes Her was released. Ah, yes, yeah, uh, yeah. We're doing well, actually. This is two out of the lot that I've seen. Yes, I've seen this one as well. Ah, so you have seen this one. Yes. Very good. It's Directed. one of the very few Bruce Willis films that I will watch again. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, it was directed by, well, a name we all know, uh, Bob Zemeckis. Mm. You may know him as the director of Back to the Future or Forrest Gump or the Pinocchio. very... 
Oh, God, fuck's sake. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm still glad that disappeared as fast as it did. It was horrible. But Del Toro's Pinocchio is apparently amazing. Uh, he also directed Flight, and he directed mm-hmm. um, the absolutely brilliant movie Contact, which I love. Um, but yes, Death Becomes Her made $149 million on a budget of $55 million. So it was a hit. And it has become kind of a cult film nowadays. It's a great movie. I yeah. mean, it really is. It, it's it is. one. It's one that I appreciated when I got older because I think I watched it at the time, expecting there to be a proper laugh out like comedy. Didn't get many of the jokes, and then watched it a few years later when I was in my twenties, and then started to realize, oh no, okay, no, I'm starting to get more of it now. Yes. Well, this movie was a pioneer in CGI mm. effects. Uh, I think it's safe to say without the work on this movie, Jurassic Park would have been a totally different movie. Yeah. So this was kind of a trial on if this could work. And it was amazing at the time. I remember seeing the first things on Entertainment Tonight for it when the movie was getting ready to be released. And I was like, wow, that's just incredible. This is the future. Um, Yeah, it is. It's some really, really nice work. Yeah, still to this day. And isn't that, but... um, Isabella Rossellini just the most beautiful creature on earth in this movie? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, it's hard to say that we there's nothing of her we have seen after Blue Velvet, but trust me, <laughs> she, she still surprises. From watching it this week, it was great to see the Greystone Mansion uh, used in a movie yet again. And I think that might be the one property in Los Angeles that has been filmed more than any place in movie history. Uh, I know from the research I've been doing. With the, with the possible exception of the, uh, the observatory. Yes. That seems actually, to be in everything. If you combine the observatory with Griffith Park. Yeah. Um, you, that would probably beat it. Because, um, oh God, what was it? Yeah, uh, Bill, you'll know. What was the hotel that Bobby Kennedy was shot in? Oh, the oh, Ambassador. That's it, yeah. The Ambassador. That was one of the biggest movie locations forever, and now it's just a park. <laughs> it's it's gone. Park. Well, they, they yeah. um, the hotel was taken down. They built in its place um, a high school, and um, it sort of has um, – there's sort of the footprint of the Ambassador there, yeah, in a way, it's really odd to see what's there now. It's very, very, it's it's odd. I used to go to the Ambassador all the time. They had a great restaurant um, there at one of the um, one of the wings of the of the hotel. Yeah, it's it's weird. You can look it up on um, Google Earth, and you can see where the building used to stand. And they kind of have this one. They have the school there, but they kind of have this little monument type thing there that. This is where it was. Mm. Death Becomes Her was a victim of test audiences, apparently. Uh, Test audiences reacted really badly. Reshoots were done on the entire third act of the movie, which ended up with all of Tracy Ullman's scenes being cut out of the movie altogether. Really? They didn't like Tracy Ullman? Yeah, well, apparently her character was... I can tell you you why it scored badly. Uh, Not because the movie was bad, although... You know, before before it was released, it's possible that there was a really bad version out there that they changed. But um, you can explain as much as you want to a research audience about visual effects that aren't there, and they yeah. don't get it. They just flat out do not get it. So um, you have to take that into account when you're doing the, the previews, because um, I guarantee you, none of the effects were in this movie yet. Right. For this movie yeah. to really, even the comedy, needs the uh, the visual effects. Yeah, yeah. well, agreed. The original the original ending of the movie is uh, Bruce Willis goes to Tracy Ullman's character to fake his death, and then he ends up with Tracy Ullman's character, and then Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn show up and find them like living together like decades later when they're all old. And apparently, it didn't score very well. They hated that ending, so they went back and. We shot it. Now, the scenes with Tracy Ullman in and this original ending, they've never been unearthed. They've never been released on any DVD or Blu-ray or even online. They must just be sitting in Universal's vault somewhere. Yeah, there'll be an assault mine under Utah or something like that. Now, the standout performance for me in this movie was a very brief one, but it's Sidney Pollack. Yes. Good old Sidney. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, it... it 
when I first saw this film, just to see Sydney appearing there, first of all, you know, I thought was really funny because my first thought was, is he, he's not directing this movie, is he? Okay, you know, I mean, I went into it knowing that Bob Zemeckis was doing it, but it's like, Sydney's not direct. Okay, Sydney's there. Okay, well, okay. And then, <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> he's hilarious. Absolutely hilarious and believable. I mean, he's so yeah. real. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he had he had that magic tendency to any role he showed up in any movie made that movie so much better. <laughs> he was really a really did. really good actor. He really was. He was a good actor. I loved working with him. We did several pictures with uh, with Sydney. Most notably, okay. Michael Clayton, which he was a producer oh, yes. of, but he also had that great part where he was oh, the head yeah. of that firm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he was. He was amazing. Uh, <laughs> So yes, uh, Death Becomes Her was a hit. It was released the same week as Buffy the Vampire Slayer, starring Christy Swanson, and another movie called BB's Kids. And it beat both of them to the number one opening for that week. Uh, it has since gone on to become a cult film. Uh, it has a lot of fans out there. But the one thing that I always has a lasting memory of it was the first ever DVD of Death Becomes Her, which had an appallingly bad transfer. And I'm talking worse than 1989's Batman Flipper. It was... Yeah, some, sometimes the um, production companies um, rushed these into um, DVD production in order to get product out there. The yeah. uh, the manufacturers of the, of the players, um, Toshiba at first, and then when everybody else jumped in, um, we're all clamoring for content. So there's some really, really bad stuff out there in the early days. The very early transfer of The Fugitive is just abysmal. It's, it's oh, just Oh, yeah, horrible. yeah, that was a fun one. When, when we were going to Blu-ray, that's when you could see just how bad that the, uh, the Fugitive was. I bought my son a PlayStation 3 uh, because it had the Blu-ray in there. He wanted the game, but, I, you know, that was PlayStation 3, right, with the Blu-ray? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. Okay, so I got him that, and then and then I went over to the video department, and, and I asked, what do you think is a good showcase for this format, film-wise? Okay, they gave me... Battlefield um, Earth. <laughs> <laughs> they, gave, they gave me Black Hawk Down, and they mm. gave me Crank. They said this, this on Blu-ray. And I took it into work. I mean, I, I watched it at home and I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. I took it into work and um, we had a Blu-ray player in our um, in our conference room, a very early Blu-ray, and everybody looked at it there and it was just incredible. It was an incredible transfer, an incredible piece of work. But that was Neville Dean and Taylor. That was... Um, that was their work that was so stunning. And then um, and then I got actually got invited to the set of Crank 2 because we were negotiating with Neville Dean and Taylor to do Jonah Hex. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that movie just follows me to every one of these shows, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, you know, that is an ominous cloud of saying, Bill, we need to do Jonah Hex at some point. <laughs> just get it out of the way with rip the Band-Aid well, off. No. Nope. No, we've already done that. To, we've already done fair game to Steve. It wouldn't be fair. Saddle him with Jonah Hex as well. I uh, know we're saddling you with it. <laughs> no, okay. no, I'm, I'm, no, no, I'm absolutely refusing. I will not. I'm, I'm going to pretend I'm Stephen Burkhoff and absolutely refuse to do it <laughs> <laughs> and disappear halfway through. So yes, uh, 1992. Death Becomes Her uh, was released, and that is the anniversaries for this week, Steve. Right. Well, I'm still surprised I was able to actually say that I've seen two of them. Two um, out of three ain't bad, as Meatloaf used to say. Yeah, that's that's true. Uh, however, there's one more part of the show where I can honestly say I'm not looking forward to this. What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? Oh, uh, and... what's in the box? Okay, we're going to do something a little bit different now because I think you have been tortured long enough and I like to kind of give you a choice. So I've changed the rules to what's in the box a little bit to give okay. you a chance. 
Okay, now, every week for What's in the Box, so it all comes down to if you can answer a film-centred question every week. If you get the answer right, you will get a certified fresh movie. If you get the answer wrong, you get a certified rotten movie. Okay. The... Now, you are not allowed to use Google. Okay. You are banned, and I will know if you have used it, because I can hear your microphone well enough to hear you clicking <laughs> and typing. That's me. <laughs> Okay, so basically, you will have four seconds to answer the question. Only four? Yes, because I know that you are a fast typer. <laughs> I'm not that bloody and fast. And I don't want you using Google. Unless you, you, you can swear down honestly that All right. you will not no, use Google. My, my phone is... Let me just tap it against the mic. That's my phone. I'm putting that down. You heard that? That was That landed on top of my diary. I have the computer open next to me so that I can monitor this uh, the recording, but that's it. I'm not okay. going to use anything. All right. But either way, you are going to get a movie to watch, but it'll be either rotten or fresh. Okay? Doesn't mean I'll like him in either way, but okay. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Okay. So, your question, Steve, and you remember, you've got to answer quick. Okay. Okay. In the early 1970s, Harrison Ford gave up acting to become a carpenter. True or false? True. True it is. You get a certified fresh yes. for this week. You have escaped <laughs> the dungeon. Yes, I know that one. Apparently, if I remember correctly, he was working on George Lucas's kitchen. He was still trying to be an actor, but he was working as a carpenter to have a second job. Lucas liked him, and he brought him in on American Graffiti. Okay. I I have pulled out the yeah. fresh box for the first time in a while. A bit dusty. <laughs> Just wipe that off. Okay. When Harrison Ford was a carpenter, he um, laid one of the beams. He he put in place one of the beams. Hold on. We will leave you with that cliffhanger till next week. I want to know what the beam is. <laughs> no. It's um, <laughs> it's a goddamn phone here. Um <laughs> Is it Harrison the beam Ford? is at the what used to be the, at the time the Sam Goldwyn Studio, which became Warner Hollywood, which became the Lot. Um, it's the old um, Fairbanks Studio on Santa Monica Boulevard in um, in Hollywood, and it's this. I mean, the studio it's it's still a major studio facility, but he um, placed a beam in the built in um, what's now the Gordon Sawyer Building, I believe, which is where they have the Mixing stages, um, ADR and Foley. Wow. So he came in to do ADR on one of our movies, and, and he was telling everybody how he put the beam in up there, and he was pointing to everybody where all the stuff was and everything. Everybody was quite impressed that uh, that he helped build their facility. Well, there you go. Well, as we say here, uh, the rules remain the same for what's in the box. I'll pick out the name of a title. Uh, if Steve has seen it, I go back in to the fresh box on this occasion and we keep picking out until we actually find one that he hasn't seen. It has never gone past three titles before. No, it hasn't. So let's have a look where we start out. So your first title. Dun, 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 dun. Please be short. Oh, it's 1987. Uh, we have John Badham's Stakeout. Yes. Is that a yes you've seen it? I've seen it. Okay, that's one. I much yeah, prefer it to the sequel. Yes, so does everyone. Uh, oh god come on you must have seen this I, I will be amazed if you haven't seen this A Fish Called Wanda yes so, oh that's two that's two two down we, we could break a record the here. car the car Cat car towers hotel <laughs> okay you have uh, Angel Heart starring Mickey Rourke and Robert De Niro no you haven't seen it that oh. can't be certified that can't be certified fresh it is. It's right up there. Oh, it's give a... me a break. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Seriously. I'm detecting a uh, a note here from you here, Bill. So, see, we, we, it's already soured because Bill obviously does not like this movie. So it, it's definitely got the, what is it, above 75? Yeah. Is that what it did? No kidding. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It currently I stands can't, on. Um, ding, da, 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 ding, 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 ding. I, I wouldn't give that to Steve. 82. I wouldn't give that to Steve. Oh, seriously? 
Yeah. Well, it's okay. Well, well it's, you know it's what? Here's rules. a chance for Steve to uh, to talk me out of it then. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what then, Bill, because I've got to watch it uh, this week. Do you want to watch it as well? No. No. <laughs> no, that's a definite no. no okay. No. I reckon we should give Bill a rotten one. <laughs> I'm not watching anything. I've already seen. You, you already gave me a rotten one. Yeah, and I'm not, to fair game as well. I've 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 been a frequent guest, but I'm not a regular. Okay, so I don't feel obligated <laughs> to watch so this. Gets stuff. Out. He uh, gets out much. of it so well. But yes, uh, Angel Heart. Uh, that is your movie. Uh, for our next episode I would like to give uh, just this section here uh, to give a couple of bits of news and shout outs one uh, we want to congratulate and we're in full support of our previous guest Ellen Dubin who is nominated for two awards at the Voice Arts Awards wow yeah she is nominated for uh, the best voiceover for an outstanding movie trailer for the movie Word Song, and you can actually see that trailer up online. She is also uh, nominated for Best Voiceover for Audiobook Narration as well, uh, for Self Help, uh, Health, and Wellness. Uh, the title of that book is Dance Me to the End 10 Months and 10 Days with ALS. Uh, something that is very close to her heart. So we are wishing her the best of luck. She yeah. is. Uh, the awards happen on the 17th, I believe, and we'll be rooting for you. Ellen, best of luck. Fingers We're crop. fully behind you. Definitely. We we want you to send us the first photo of you holding your awards. And we will share it on yeah. our party work pages. Uh, I also want to notice here that we are on the countdown to the long-touted Christmas show that we didn't get to do last year thanks to COVID, or more succinctly, Steve having COVID. Yeah, afraid so. Uh, but this year, uh, we are doing it. And so far, we have a stacked lineup of people coming in for this uh, very special show. Uh, we are going to do a team versus team quiz also with prizes. Oh, yes. Ooh. We are currently setting that up. We've so got a budget on- for that, have we? No one's told uh, I, me. Yes, I, I splurged out on it myself. Really? Um, remind me to wipe that off. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yes, so far we have John Ashton returning this early as well, which is amazing. Yeah. We also have Bill Daly, our current DS from this week. Uh, Richard Mirish, uh, he'll finally be returning to us. Also, we have Rick Ravenello, we have Elizabeth J. Carlisle, and we have one other guest that we're looking to confirm as well, which we should do by next week's show. And it is just going to be the ultimate Christmas party full of fun, laughter with the guests that have really helped us launch this show into another level, and we love having back. Yes, and there's also going to be alcohol. For some of us, yes. Unfortunately, all the people in the States, it'll be afternoon for them. Yeah, it's, it's past five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> yeah. We know we know John's going to have his cigar. I'm going to probably have a G&T or something like that. Yes, well, it's, it's going to be night for us. So yes, <laughs> it's going well. to be interesting, though, isn't it? When the hosts just end up getting more and more drunk. <laughs> okay, so question twenty-five. No, shh. no, shh. I love you, mm. <laughs> Bill. Uh, Always great to have you on the show. Thank you for coming on and completely shitting oh, thank you. the fair game. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, God damn it. There's Joel Silver on the phone now saying, you asshole. <laughs> uh, and Steve, I was very impressed just now with your impression of Rachel. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I've, I've missed something, haven't I? <laughs> uh, you, you're going you're gonna to have to explain this one to him, Bill. Please. I have well, I have the video. Aren't you the one that shot the video of Rachel when she was she was sloppy drunk outside oh, the oh, bar? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Rachel. I, yeah, I was all confused. Oh, it's hilarious. Yeah. It's absolutely hilarious. Yeah, we're not going to be releasing it because, you know, poor poor girl. But yes, Andy's birthday, there was a rather drunken conversation outside of the bar. Yeah. About Harry Potter. About Harry Potter. <laughs> it, what what sells it though is your face, Bill. Throughout the whole thing. <laughs> so, but, could, Bill's a devil. Bill is a devil you, around groups of people. 
Yeah. I kept egging her on. Yeah. <laughs> you should have you should have been in the cab on the way home. That was just genius because every time oh, she God, stopped yeah. talking, Bill egged her on some more so she'd continue. <laughs> Listen, we shouldn't be talking about this on the no. podcast, okay? Well, you can, you've, can, you've kind of ruined it now. That's it. It's on there. And she's going to listen to this, and she's going to be like, I hate you all. Um, anyway. But we, but we love you, Rachel. Yeah, that was a good night. Um, yeah, so, yes, with that in mind, stay uh, stay tuned for the Christmas quiz. Uh, but in the meantime, I guess it's a goodbye from our good guest, Bill Daly. Thank you for having me. It is a goodbye from me. And I guess I've got to say goodbye, otherwise I'll be talking to myself as usual. Bye.